Data, you might have heard about it. Big data, little data, structured data, unstructured data. Data is the new oil. And data will be responsible, like oil, for the largest transfer of wealth from one place to another since the Industrial Revolution. And we're at an inflection point in this data economy because the economy itself has a bunch of tools that are becoming, actually kind of getting in the way. They're sort of at the end of their lifespan. And then there's a bunch of new tools that you guys need to know about, because you all are going to have to deal with them, that are fundamentally going to change the way we process data. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So let's begin with the first tool that's been around for about 20 years, browsers. And in 20 years ago, they, they looked like the first one, and they look like the second one now. All right, let me, let me tell you how browsers worked 20 years ago. You had to invoke them, and then you had to type text into a text box, and then you had to hit enter, and then you got back 10 blue links. 20 years later, let me tell you how a browser works. You have to invoke it, you have to type text into a text box, you have to hit enter, and you get 10 blue links. Where's the progress in that? And what do you do? There's the popular kids on page one. That's where the pop, browsers are like high school. That's the in crowd. And you get part of the in crowd by being one of the popular kids or by buying your way in by being one of the rich kids. This is the way it works. I don't make up the rules, I just report on them. But it's a little different than it was 20 years ago, because 20 years ago you saw the first 10 of maybe 30 results, maybe only eight results. Now you see the first 10 results of 46 million. Right? This is just a simple search. Who are those poor bastards on page eight? Anybody ever been to page eight? I can say bastard over here, can't I? This is, this is England, we can do this stuff. How do you get to that? This is crazy. So there's a better way, though, now. Thanks to Steve Jobs, there's a better way because Steve Jobs was the first person to innovate on this data economy since 1994. Steve Jobs had an insight that I don't think people appreciate just how brilliant it was. Steve Jobs looked at a browser and said, you know what? No one ever really needs the entire web. Every time you're searching for something, you, you're searching for a recipe, you're searching for a diet plan, you're searching for sports scores, you got a task in mind. You never need to search the whole web, you only need part of it. And this, my friends, is fundamental to the app model. Because if you install a football app, that's a very strong signal. You're interested in football, and that app can sit in the background, and that app can gather football scores, it can search the web for you. And apps are just that much more powerful than browsers. They're that much more meaningful. The signal is that much stronger. But there's a fundamental flaw in apps, too, that's bringing the whole app economy to its knees. And it's zombies. You all know about zombies, right? You all seen this movie? Have you all seen this movie? Zombies are real, folks. Not like that. Not like that bullshit vampire stuff we had to deal with a few years ago. You all remember that? The vampires are made up, zombies are real, and they're coming. We can create a virus that does a zombie-like condition in the lab, it's coming, you gotta watch every single movie about zombies, you gotta get ready for the apocalypse. Now, this happens to be the perfect zombie movie because it's got Brad Pitt in it, right? The first zombie movie I can take my date to, hallelujah! And there we were, at this most perfect movie, watching, I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, zombies. And, it, and she's like, oh, Brad Pitt. And I'm like, oh, zombies. And she's like, oh, Brad Pitt. She heard about the shirtless scene. She heard about it. But then something really amazing happens. My date pulls out her cell phone. And she begins looking down at her cell phone during this most perfect movie. I'm shocked. I'm, I'm completely reevaluating my taste in women. And then to make it worse, she starts mumbling. I hear her go, five, four, three. 
two, one. And she gets the one, she touches me on the knee and says, I'll be right back. And she leaves the movie theater during this most perfect movie. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm coming up with my breakup lines, man. This chick is out of my life. She comes back one, two, three minutes later, she comes back and she sits down. Now generally, when you're at the movies with somebody and you leave and you come back, you turn to him and you say, what did I miss? And she didn't say it. So being proactive, I said, hey, you didn't miss anything. And do you know what she told me? She said, I know, I know, because she has an app that tells her when to pee at the movies. There's an app for that. Somebody has watched every movie. They've curated all the data. They're like, oh, this is a good part. Plot twist, don't miss this. Oh, here's a new character introduced, don't miss this. Here's five minutes, nothing happens, go take a piss. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? And if you just gotta go, right, you just gotta go, it'll tell you what you're missing while you're, while you're going. What a great app. Now, I ask you, how many of you all go to see movies? Well, just raise your hand if you are moviegoers. I think it's safe to say everybody. Now, lower your hand and raise it if you have this app. This, my friends, is the app discoverability problem. And this is killing the app economy because developers write these beautiful apps that everybody can use. You all go to the movies, and I'm assuming you all pee. Right? You could all use this app, and you don't know about it. That's what's killing the app economy. We don't know about the functionality that's out there. There's stuff we can use, and we don't even know about it. And it's going to get worse. The Internet of Things is coming. People say, oh, the Internet of Things, right? You can, you, you can turn your lights on. I'm like, I, you know, that's really not a big problem for me. Here, let me walk over here. Oh, there are the lights on. You saved me eight seconds. Thank you very much. Oh, you can, you can hook it into your burglar alarm, and when you're out of town, you can monitor your kids having parties. I'm like, I want my kids to party, right? Maybe they'll be on page one if they have a decent party. They'll be one of the cool kids. It's, I don't want my kids not to party, and I certainly don't want to watch them while they're partying. That's creepy. So I thought, what can I do with the Internet of Things? I'm an engineer. I decided my hot tub needed to be on the, engineer, on the Internet of Things, and I coded it up. My hot tub is now capable of monitoring its own water quality. It does it itself. I used to have to do that. It's capable of uh, ordering its own chemicals on Amazon and having them delivered to the house. And I can't wait until the Amazon drones come, right? Because I, I just picture this flying right over my hot tub and just squirting the damn chemicals <laughs> right, right into it. That's why it also can open its own uh, uh, top via my cell phone, right? How cool is that? Now, think about what this does to the ads economy, because you know these browsers and these browsers are the perfect, uh, browsers are like American sports. They have lots of pauses for commercial interruption. Uh, oh, we think you're interested in this. Here's a commercial. Oh man, are you paying too much for car insurance? Right? Is your thing not big enough? Because <laughs> we can help. Right? There's all these commercials, it's just like American football. That what's coming now is something that's like, more like your all sports, where you don't have all of these commercials. You all actually have, I don't even understand your all sports. I was looking at cricket scores the other day, I couldn't even tell which team was winning. <laughs> Internet of Things, how do you put a commercial in the Internet of Things? How do you say, oh, hot tub, before you order your chemicals, you know, let, let me advertise for you. Because the hot tubs, they're all going to talk to each other. They're going to know. One hot tub's going to say, hey, man, I bought this cheap-ass chemical. And, and three days later, my water quality's bad. And another hot tub's going to say, hey, I bought this other chemical. It's more expensive. But my water quality's lasting 14 days. The machines are going to know. How do you advertise to a machine when they know the truth? You can't lie to a machine. Not that you all would do that. That's what the American advertisers do. They fundamentally changed the game, and then quantum computers. What about when quantum computers can do anything they damn well please in a matter of seconds? When quantum computers make it capable for every single human being to carry around an index of the world's information in their pocket or on their face or sewn into their clothes. When they don't have to go out for data anymore, where do you place the ads? How do you interrupt that loop for that commercial interruption? You can't. 
Where are you, what are you people going to be doing in this new economy? How are you all going to provide value? Look, it's already happening. Check this out. I'm going to show you code because I'm an engineer and I think everybody needs to look at code. This is Visual Studio. Now, when I'm coding in Visual Studio, I always get this feeling somebody's coded this before. And I'm right because somebody has coded everything before. Now, I used to have to go to a browser and I used to have to search for, hey, I need, a, I need some code to read a file line by line. And then, of course, I'd see ads. I'd see all this other stuff. I'd finally find my code. I'd have to copy it in, change all the variable names. Visual Studio does that. What it's done now is it's expanded. It, it is an app that said, hey, I'm going to steal that idea from Steve Jobs. If somebody is using me, they're interested in code. They're interested in all the web that has to do with code. So instead of Visual Studio just being about, about one programmer, it's about all programmers simultaneously. A one Visual Studio can talk to the other Visual Studios just like the hot tubs can talk to each other and say, hey, when your person is coding this, this is the type of stuff they need, and it does it today. This is called code search. Not only will it go out and find that code, it will copy it into your IDE, change the variable names to the ones that you have, and you don't even have to do anything. It's like magic. All the developers in the world don't have to talk to each other. Their tools can talk to each other for them. What this has done is it's expanded. It's taken over the part of the web that has to do with coders. It works for PowerPoint, too. If you're doing in PowerPoint, what part of the web do you need? You need images. You need to do research. PowerPoint now does that for you. You don't need a browser. You don't need a separate app. PowerPoint has expanded its borders to say, this is about all of the web that presenters need. And, and we're going to help them get it without a browser in the loop. Where do you put a commercial in this? Where do you put an ad in this? How do you monetize this? It, and and it, it's contextual. Imagine when we allow Twitter to do this. Imagine when we allow email to do this. This is email. This is an email from my daughter. And this email scares me. I don't like email from my kids. Because you find out shit about them that you might not want to find out. In fact, this is actually not my daughter. This is the email. This is my daughter that Microsoft Legal gave me when I when I when I submitted these slides. I said I want to use these. And all of a sudden, my blonde Bailey came back as a brunette Jennifer, and I'm like, what, what, "Where'd you put my daughter?" And they said, "Oh, James, you can't use your daughter's name and picture. We're concerned about her privacy." And I said, "Really? Have you seen her Facebook page? <laughs> she doesn't give a shit about her privacy." And then the second thing that scares me about this is I'm going to, she's asking me to take her to a concert. I'm going to find out what kind of music she likes. That's when you know whether you've been a good parent. Because if she's grown up to like somebody named Justin, I don't care what your last name is. If your first name is Justin, just shut up. I don't want to hear you. And so now what this email program has to do is it has to expand to the web and it has to go out and it has to be able to find all of the things that it might need instead of me going to a browser. And so it does. It says, hey, I know about this band of monsters and men, of monsters and men. What kind of name is it? I'm from Seattle. We name our bands Alice in Chains, right? Badass names of monsters and men. That's a stupid name. I'm frightened to death of this. And in the Paramount Theater, we legalized marijuana. You actually can buy marijuana on your cell phone, by the way, in Seattle. We legalized marijuana. Our downtown got really interesting really fast, right? And I have nothing against how the, the, the direction of interesting that Seattle has taken. I just don't want to go there with my daughter. She's a teenager, right? So now I don't have to go to the web anymore because the web comes to me. This is the web. It just looks a little different because it's not rendered in a browser. It looks better than if it was rendered in a browser. This is the web, brought right into your email program, brought right into Twitter, brought right into Facebook, wherever you need it, wherever it, it's going to figure out you need to search and it's going to search for you. Where do you put an ad? You guys have to work on this. You have to understand that this data economy is moving away from advertisement and it's moving toward value. Who can get me the value that I need the quickest? And I can even listen to the music from here. I'm thinking guitar, it's not Justin, this is good. And then I hear this. Take oh, it over this time. Listen to this woman's voice. 
It's like Janice Joplin and, and Stevie Nicks somehow got I genetically, got vocally merged. And I just get this sensation at all. My daughter likes good music. I'm so happy. And so now I think, all right, I'm going to see this. I am going to see this concert. The question is now, am I going to take my daughter with me? Because I got to figure out where this Paramount Theater thing is. No web involved, no ads involved. Who can give me this data the fastest and get it to the user wherever the user happens to be? This is the new data economy. And, and so everything is here. This is the web. I can do everything I can do on the web. It's just I don't have to go to the web to do it. The web comes to me. So this is happening. This is happening now. We have a completely different way that we're dealing with data. Imagine something like Twitter. I tweeted this. This is a real tweet I tweeted uh, some eight, nine months ago. I sent it out. I said, hey, I'm going to Boston and New York. I'm into live music. Any locals have recommendations for me? Now, I've got a few thousand Twitter followers. It's good, right? How many of those Twitter followers happen to live in Boston and New York? How many of them happen to like the kind of music I like and can recommend a, a venue? I can tell you how many. Zero. I didn't get any reach. I didn't get any replies. I got two favorites. Why would you favorite this? This makes no sense to me. You're favoriting my lack of rock and roll. So anyhow, I thought this is not the way Twitter should work. I shouldn't tweet to people who follow me. I should tweet to people who can help me. And so that's the code I wrote here. What it does is it finds live music venues in, in this case, Boston and New York, and it tweets my tweet directly to them. And look at what happened. Within one minute, I got back, I think it was 13 tweets, within one minute, because they have social media people watching this, right? Within one minute, Hyatt Regency says, hey man, come to Boston Beehive and listen to some jazz. And I'm like, nah. Boston Symphony says, oh, you need to come to here and listen to some classical music. And I'm like, marijuana has not been legal long enough for me to like classical music. Sorry. <laughs> but we're working on it. And then rock and roll at the Orpheum. Cage the Elephant and the Foles, two awesome bands that I was able to go to. And of course, we can bring the web to Twitter, too, because that's the way it's beginning to work. People are doing less work. Machines are doing more work. Data is being, we, we figure out when you want the data, and we bring it to you at the point at which you figured it out. Sometimes we figure it out even faster. This is all re available today. All of this is available today, using existing APIs, using existing technology. The world is changing, folks. Data has been tamed. We understand it. The machine learning has gotten to a point where we are predicting presidential elections months before we even bother. I even wonder why we bother voting. We know who's going to win. The World Cup, we predicted it. Why bother playing that game? Can't put any commercials in it anyhow. So, so this is what you have to deal with. Over the next few years, this is going to become more and more prevalent. Over the next few years, there is going to be more data that is generated by machines and consumed by machines than generated and consumed by human beings. Where do you put an ad in that? When information is carried around in our pockets, where there is no loop out that a third party can get itself inserted into, where do you put an advertisement? Things are changing. It's not ads anymore. It's value. So how do you get your story out? How do you make sure that your value is appreciated by the machines? How do you make sure that your value can somehow be involved in this ecosystem even without its ability to insert it in at some transaction level? It has to be involved in the ecosystem to begin with. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. So it's a data economy. Ads are more difficult in a data economy. We know more things. Users have to guess less. There are fewer places to stop for a commercial interruption. This is coming. There's not a question whether it's going to get here or not. It's a question about when. And it's coming. A lot of it's here now. The next few months, you're going to see more and more of it. And over the next couple of years, you're going to see less and less of the world that you know. Prepare yourself. My name is James Whitaker. I work for Microsoft. And I am finished. Thank you. Only just begun